Hi, I'm Rex Black, president of RBCS. Welcome to the RBCS YouTube channel. Hey, I hope you enjoy all these free resources that are available here. And do us one favor. We need to keep the lights on and we need your help to do that. So when you need testing and quality related services, training, consulting, expert services, you name it, let us be one of the bidders on that next job. We don't expect to get all of your business, but we'd like to get a chance. Thanks and enjoy the shows. <clears throat> the broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. On behalf of RBCS and Software Test Professionals, welcome to this webinar on advanced, advanced software testing, solving test puzzles with policies, strategies, and plans. I am Rex Black. I'm the president of RBCS. We're a worldwide testing and quality assurance firm. We serve clients that range from small startups to Fortune 20 global enterprises. Been around since 1994, delivering insight and confidence to hundreds of clients around the world. Our team of international consultants deliver customized training, consulting, and outsourcing services for companies that are looking to improve their test and quality assurance practices. I am the author of 10 books on software testing. I won't bore you with all the titles, but uh, one is the bestseller managing the testing process, and uh, also uh, new e-books, um, including uh, testing metrics, measuring product, process, and project quality. We are presenting this uh, webinar in partnership with Software Test Professionals, so check out their website, www.softwaretestpro.com. Um, attending today's webinar can get you credits for QAI and ASQ recertification, so if you are looking for that, make sure you check with them. Make sure you understand how to qualify. At the very least, you'll probably need to save the attendee email that you'll receive after this webinar as proof that you did attend. Um, <coughs> pardon me. Attendance will definitely get you PMI PDUs as well. Thank you to Mike Lindhorst for reviewing the materials and making valuable suggestions. You can visit www.pmi.org to claim the PDUs using code ASTTP100. Our provider ID is 2986. Uh, that, that information will be in the attendee email that you will receive, um, so you do not need to ask for it to be repeated. Uh, please note that PDUs are available for live webinar attendance only. No recorded um, webinar can be used uh, to uh, gain the PDUs. So before we start, some housekeeping notes. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, submit them at any time uh, via your webinar interface. But please do note that I will only look at them at the very end of the presentation when we get into the half-hour Q&A session. You do not need to ask for copies of the presentation. The presentation is already on the web. It's at rbcs-us.com. Navigate to the Resources tab in the upper middle of that page. And then uh, from there, navigate to the Basic Library page and you, you will then find the um, slides on that page. Um, also, you were uh, registered to uh, the free e-learning uh, drawing that will happen uh, by attending, so check your email over the next couple days. You might be the lucky winner. If you're having any problems, audio or visual problems, uh, please contact GoToWebinar Support. Generally, these problems come down to issues of browser compatibility, uh, not working properly with GoToWebinar. Company firewalls, um, which is a harder problem to solve. You have to make sure your company um, security policy allows for connecting to go to webinar. Sometimes it's audio settings on your PC. So if you're hearing strange audio or very muted audio, try the audio settings on your PC. I uh, hope you enjoy this free webinar. We do these as a service to the software testing community because at RBCS we are a not just for profit company. Today we are going to talk about test policies, test strategies, and plans, and how we can use those to solve uh, uh, testing puzzles. See the rather amusing um, illustration here of the six-step process for uh, um, solving a Rubik's Cube, <laughs> hitting it with a hammer. Hopefully we can do something a little less brute force than that. Um, this so. Uh, is part of a larger series of advanced software testing uh, webinars um, drawn from uh, my this particular one drawn from my book advanced software testing volume 2 and managing the testing process third edition so um, test policy strategies and plans are uh, ways to solve your Rubik's cube without uh, um, hitting it with a hammer uh, a more elegant way of getting to a solution of uh, how your 
your testing should proceed. So we'll look at these. Um, let's start with uh, what is a test policy. Now this word, you know, you say policy, and people go, oh, God, policy, policy. You know, so something is going to be written down is totally uh, disconnected from day-to-day -day reality. But what I'm talking about here is a really useful, short, lightweight document that is going to give you the why you test. Why does your organization test? What are you trying to accomplish? What are the objectives of the organization for its testing? Now, testing works well. What happens? What gets done? What? How do we recognize success? Uh, now, a test policy is something that should be uh, developed uh, um, by reaching consensus between test managers or directors, uh, senior level test management, uh, together with the uh, managers of the various stakeholder groups um, that that work with testing and uh, that rely on the results of testing, both business and technical stakeholders. So we want to talk about our objectives. What, what, are we, what are the objectives? How are we going to measure whether we're effectively and efficiently meeting those objectives? What does the process look like at a high level? How do we improve the process over time? What business value do we deliver to the organization? All those things should be clearly and succinctly stated in your test policy. Here you see an example of a test policy uh, from one of our clients. We helped put this uh, together. So we have a, a short uh, mission statement there, um, a uh, brief, um, anonymized, uh, description of the uh, way that um, risk-based testing strategy is followed on the, uh, by the organization, and then uh, some information about the different levels of testing, unit test, integration test, system test, and acceptance test, the owner, uh, the, the groups that own those, um, the objectives, and the types of testing that are uh, performed. So as you can see, this is kind of you know testing in a nutshell. Now there's actually a second page to this document, but it's um, about half the length of this one, and it's just very high level. This is, this is what we do and why we do it. So if you can't reach consensus on this, you really can't succeed because um, that means that people don't agree on uh, what you do and how you go about doing it and how that relates to other things. So far from being sort of a bureaucratic, um, insignificant exercise in you know, generating paper, um, Really, setting the policy is all about making sure that we, we all, we, the testing and its, and its stakeholders, agree on what we're trying to accomplish. And uh, since testing exists to provide a service to the broader organization, getting to this agreement is really important. Um, if we, again, to reiterate, if we can't agree on what a successful testing organization looks like, then certainly in the eyes of some of the stakeholders, uh, your testing organization is failing, or at least not doing what it should. And that can be a very dangerous situation to be in, especially if you get into any sort of uh, budget crunch or um, uh, you know, economic downturn situation because uh, you know, the, value, the business value of what you're doing is not recognized, then you would not expect that you would be able to retain resources. So policies are definitely a very important thing to have, um, and uh, really even more so than the policy itself is the conversations that happen leading up to the creation and approval of a policy that, that everybody agrees on. And here's you see the, uh, the next page of that policy, uh, you know, even, even more, you know, less verbiage, if you will, we've got a, a basic uh, illustration of the testing process here, and then um, um, description of the key, the key process indicators that are used to measure how well uh, the, uh, the testing is being done at, at each of the levels. Okay, so we have established uh, um, policy. We've said this is what we want to accomplish. Um, Ideally, of course, the policy would be in place before the test group was set up, but in many cases, test groups are set up as sort of a general, we have pain in terms of quality, so we need to have a test group. And so if that's the case, 
then um, you know you want to um, uh, get that policy in place to, to to try to build that consensus. Now, policy is different than the strategy. So the strategy, your test strategy, is basically how you're going to go about achieving the policy in a general sense, not on a project by project basis, but just in general, how does your test team work? Um, so it should address things like how do you deal with quality or product risks? Um, and you use risk-based testing to address those. So how does risk-based testing work? What is your implementation for that? Who participates? Not who necessarily by name, but who by role. Um, how do you deal with project risks, test-related project risks? What's your, your general um, approach to, to mitigating those risks or putting contingency plans in place? How do you go about that? Um, <clears throat> for each of the test levels that will be carried out, unit test, integration test, system test, acceptance test, system integration test, whatever the test levels are in your organization, um, what are the entry and exit criteria for those test levels? What are the what are the what is each level expected to cover? How do you measure coverage? Uh, what is what is the, what are the coverage criteria? Typically, in say system test level, you'd look at things like risk coverage, requirements coverage, configuration coverage, uh, data coverage, those sort of things. Whereas at a unit test level, you might be looking at code coverage. So you know, get to an agreement on on how we're going to determine what constitutes adequate testing at each level. Um, how do we uh, report bugs? How do we track tests? What tools do we use? Um, all of those sort of things are things that can go into a test strategy document. Now, there are different types of strategies, um, and I actually addressed this in a previous webinar, so I don't want to go through this in, in detail. I would uh, refer you to the digital library. So if you go to rbcs-us.com and navigate to the resources tab in the uh, upper middle and then you can uh, that's going to pull down a menu and you can navigate from there to the digital library and you can find my uh, recorded webinar on testing strategies look at the different types of strategies um, and uh, these these different strategies can be um, blended together should be blended together to try to um, uh, deal with the um, vagaries and differences and priorities of your particular organization, your application, the life cycle that you're following, um, type of risks you're dealing with, any sort of regulatory requirements, um, you know, where, um, what you do for new product development and what you do for maintenance, should that should uh, be taken into account. Um, and of course, the, pol the, the strategy should should align with the policy. The strategy strategy should be um, written in such a way that it's going to enable the achievement of the objectives that were set out in the policy, and uh, and should follow um, the uh, much more general um, concepts, I guess, that were introduced at the policy level. It fleshes them out. Uh, so. Certainly, there should be a, a perfect alignment there between the, the policy and the strategy uh, and um, effectively traceability of the strategy back to the policy and from the policy to the strategy so that if anybody's looking at the policy and says, how do you do that? I see that you've got this objective. How do you do that? How do you know that you're achieving that objective? You can actually point to parts of the, of the strategy that, that uh, talk about how that's going to be carried out. Um, now, other things that you might address in a strategy document, um, how, how does integration work? If you're in charge of doing component integration or system integration, how does that work? Um, you know, top down, bottom up, um, backbone, um, neighborhood, there's various uh, integration approaches out there. So talk about the ones you use, and if there are multiple ones, how do you select one on a particular project? Um, how are the tests going to be specified? What degree of documentation is going to be kept? What is what constitutes a properly documented test case? Uh, uh, what constitutes independence of the test team? Uh, how is that ensured um, for those test levels that are done by entities that would not be independent? How is that uh, dealt with um, or is that simply accepted? If there are any sort of standards that are being followed, there should be a discussion about how those standards are 
to be put in place, direction given to uh, location of templates and such that might be called for by the standards. How is confirmation testing done? So when you get a defect uh, fix back from development, how do you do confirmation testing? What's the general process for that? Um, what happens to the defect after the confirmation test is over and the confirmation test passed? What happens to the defect report, that is. What happens to the defect report if the confirmation test fails? What do you do? What's the proper thing to do? What happens if you see a new defect while you're running a confirmation test? Um, regression testing. How is regression testing carried out? Do you use automation? Is it done uh, manually? Um, there's automation. Is there data that goes with that? How does that data get loaded? What tools are used? Um, <clears throat> how do you go about reusing various uh, work products? Um, you know, if there's data is created, how does it get archived? Where, where are those various repositories in which uh, reusable test work products are stored? And um, how would one go about finding that? Uh, if there's, um, if they're going to be modified, how is that? How's change control work there? Is there a configuration management process? How does it work? How um, do where what what are your test environments? How are they set up? Who supports them? If you have a problem with the test environment, who do you go to? Um, as I mentioned before, what tools do you use? Uh, how is test control done? In other words, how does the uh, test manager or director of testing uh, make sure that the project's uh, testing effort is constantly pointed in a direction of, that maximizes the uh, effectiveness and efficiency and, and, and um, you know, achieves the objective set out in the policy. Um, how are results reported? Uh, what metrics are gathered? And not just product and project metrics for results reporting, but also process metrics. How do we ensure that we're gathering the proper process metrics? Um, how do we manage defects throughout the life cycle? Was there a bug triage committee? Who's on that committee? Again, by role rather than name. Um, um, <coughs> What general roles and responsibilities are there inside the testing team and what roles and responsibilities are there outside the testing team that interact with testing? For example, who's responsible for delivering builds for testing? And again, roles, not individual names. So the idea here is to describe in general um, what goes on on testing. Now you may say, hmm, and this seems like an awful lot of documentation and isn't this going to all be in the test plan anyway? Now, this is one of the beauties of a properly created test strategy is by explaining things generally in the test strategy, and this thing can be a document or it can be a wiki or an intranet page or what have you. It doesn't have to be necessarily a Word document, but by describing um, all of this stuff, all of these activities and how they're carried out and so forth in, in a strategy document, they don't have to be in the plan. All you have to do in the test plan is say refer to section X of the test strategy. Now, to the extent that the test plan um, requires that you um, provide further details than for, for something that's in the strategy, of course you would need to do that. So, you know, when you're talking about roles and responsibilities, you're talking generally speaking, um, you know, by, by title basically, um, in, in a strategy on a particular project, you would actually name somebody. But in the strategy, we're going to try to say as much to, to the extent that we can, this is how we do what we do in a project independent way. Um, again, a very useful document that can uh, actually reduce the overall amount of time that's spent creating documents because it reduces the, uh, the need for extensive test plans associated with each project. So here's an example um, of uh, <coughs> part of a test strategy document here. Now, um, this organization used risk-based testing, and they had um, um, they would have an overall assessment of, of risk for particular functional areas, and you can see that would go from very high to very low. And um, then they had um, what they defined as, as approaches. There, there's the platinum approach, the gold approach, the silver approach, the lead approach, and the mercury approach. Um, and you see you select the approach based on the level of risk. Uh, so 
the um, entry criteria vary. They're very rigorous with the platinum approach down to there's no entry criteria at all in the mercury because the mercury there's not going to be any testing. Uh, we have the um, the uh, coverage, um, you know, the, uh, the the degree of coverage that we're going to achieve in terms of uh, uh, mission critical, that's MC. Mission critical is going to get extensive coverage, and there was a separate definition of what extensive coverage meant. Non-mission critical would get broad coverage. Regression testing would be automated. This is the case of platinum. You can see that it, the uh, amount of testing uh, goes down as we get down into the lower uh, approaches there. And uh, then we have um, uh, our exit criteria that are associated. And again, these are general. They're going to be made specific in the plan. Um, and then we say, what's the residual level of risk? Let me um, get a spotlight out here. We've got the residual level of risk that's left at the end of the um, process based on the application of that particular approach. And then in some cases, you know, you, 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 there's the approach that you would want to carry out and the approach that you actually can carry out because of time constraints. So what we see here is we've got a table that says, okay, these different levels of, of initial risk, if you select, you know, which approach, you know, what's the residual level of risk at the end uh, of the uh, um, of applying that approach. So, for example, if we if if we apply the lead uh, approach to something that started off very high, you notice that this is um, you know totally discretionary in terms of variation from you know the good practices, software engineering practices, and and you know unit testing might or might not have happened. The reviews might or might not have happened, and we're just going to do opportunistic testing of the mission critical software not going to do any regression testing or testing of non-mission critical software. So, you know, not, not a lot of coverage, not a lot of confidence that things are going to work properly and quality would be fairly low. So, you know, if we do, if we apply the lead approach to something that's very high risk, you can expect that at the end of that, it's going to, um, um, you know, be, be still fairly high risk. But if you're under time pressure, you might recommended approach might be platinum, but you might actually settle for gold or silver because of the, uh, the time. So the strategy helps us visualize and uh, discuss uh, with stakeholders, again, the trade-offs that are inherent in um, uh, uh, trading off schedule versus testing coverage. It's like, well, what, what does that mean? It's important that that be explicit and that the test manager can make that explicit because, you know, when the, when the residual level of risk is unclear to people it's associated with a particular amount of testing, I mean, they want, they want testing. Most people want testing, but, the, you know, how much of it do they need and what specifically does it get them? In, this, in these two slides, which you've seen is a way of making that, uh, that which is quite often invisible to people visible. Uh, as part of your strategy. So, so that's, again, very nice. It's a communication tool, um, both within the testing team about how we go about carrying things out, and also to people outside the testing team about, you know, what does that mean for me? What does that mean for the stakeholders? Okay, so strategy was um, general. Now, the test plan is going to be specific. So we're going to have a test plan that is going to say, how exactly are we going to implement the strategy on this project? And like with writing a strategy, this is going to help us think through how we're going to go about doing things and also serve as a communication tool. It'll communicate with the other participants on the project uh, about, you know, what, what are we going to do? Um, now, in some cases, you'll have a single plan. In some cases, you will have multiple plans. Um, and it depends on, uh, you know, different groups that own different levels of testing. You'd expect that they, the different groups might very well have plans, um, in which case you need some way of coordinating those together. So sometimes you have what's called a master test plan, which describes testing in general, regardless of level. Um, 
and then things that are level specific will be discussed in the, the test plans for that level. So unit testing might talk about uh, what specific tool is going to be used to measure code coverage, um, whereas the system test plan might talk about uh, how the, the tool that's going to be used to measure requirements and, and risk coverage and so forth. Now, one thing that's true of these plans as well as of the strategy and the policy documents is that uh, it's very useful to use these as a communication tool, circulate drafts, get people talking about them, make sure that you're, you're on the right track with these things. You don't want to just uh, go off into your office and create a strategy document, come out and say, oh, behold, the strategy, or create a plan and come out and say, hey, here's the plan, this is great. And then people might say, well, no, it's not so great, it's actually not going to work. Uh, and remember, part of the value here is as a communication tool, so we want to make sure that we're using this to effectively communicate to people. Now, um, <clears throat> what kind of things go in a test plan? Well, certainly you want to make specific how the strategy is going to be carried out, so you want to define anything that is, is um, described in a general sense in the uh, strategy. You want to then say, no, specifically this is how it's going to be done. Uh, in addition, you want to talk about what's to be tested and what's not to be tested. What, is, uh, uh, what items will be delivered to you? What items might be created as part of the project and you're not going to test? Maybe you don't test documentation, for example. So you say you're going to test the software, uh, but not the documentation. So that might be an example of what's tested and what's not. Also, what's in scope and what out of scope in terms of, of the quality characteristics that you'll test? Uh, are you going to test performance? Are you going to test reliability? Are you going to test usability? You know, most of the time, functionality is sort of a given, right? But you know, what other characteristics, quality characteristics, are going to be covered and, and, and what are not? Just so that, that everybody's clear about, you know, this is what we're going to do and this is what we're not going to do. Um, Establishing the relationship among the levels if that hasn't already been done in the test strategy. Um, if it has been done in the test strategy, but it's going to be a little different for the, the test plan, then you need to make sure that that's the case. Um, how do you coordinate the scope across the different levels? That's something that needs to be addressed. How do we make sure that the right things have been covered at each level? Um, what is our schedule? What are the major milestones? What's um, uh, the budget? That might be in a separate spreadsheet, but it's still part of the plan. Um, how, how are we doing our test execution, and how does that relate to delivery of test releases from the software release plan? That all needs to be defined. Um, <clears throat> the different um, stakeholders and participants, how are they going to relate to testing? What do they deliver to us? What do we deliver to them? Um, making specific the entry criteria, the exit criteria. Uh, also, I like to have continuation criteria, which says these are the things that need to be true for us to be able to continue to test. Um, specific ownership of the, of the test levels. In other words, this is actually down to names. Before, it was titles roles, now it will be names. Um, what are the handoffs that happen from one test level to the next, and how, how do those get carried out? Um, any sort of test-related project risks that might exist um, should be identified in the test plan, as well as how you're going to um, mitigate those risks and contingency plans that you'll have in place in case in spite of your attempts to mitigate, those risks become undesirable outcomes. And do try to be specific about the risks. I, I saw a test plan last year when I was doing an assessment, and it was just uh, uh, just the most general, generic statements were made about risks and how one might go about um, addressing those. And it was clear that there was no real way that 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 would translate into actual risk management in the event, you know, that there was that it was written down, it was in there because someone knew it needed to be in there, but it, it just was not actionable. So, you know, test plans need to be actionable. Um, a 
whole thing, uh, especially the, 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 how you're going to manage the test-related project risks. And then finally, the test plan should also address the issue of uh, governance, of, of decision making. Of, you know, what is what is the individual tester empowered to do? What does the test manager decide? What gets decided by bug triage committees? How is the um, test manager report to project managers or product managers? There's a director of testing. How does the manager of the testing on a given project report up to the director? All these sort of things. And again, some of this stuff might be migrated up into the test strategy and dealt with there. Um, the more you can move content up into a test strategy, um, the better, less documentation you'll need. Now, of course, what needs to be true to be able to move stuff into a test strategy is you need to do things the same way from one project to the next. Here's an example of uh, the work product flow diagram from a test plan. Um, we had, as you can see, a number of different um, teams involved in, um, in this particular uh, project. And um, it's been somewhat anonymized here, but based on a real project. And uh, there's a lot of stuff flowing back and forth. So what we've done is um, drawn uh, a diagram that shows how the different groups relate to each other and how the different work products flow back and forth between the groups on this project just to help make that relationship clear. Another thing that can be helpful is a diagram like this, an organizational setting diagram. Um, and this diagram is going to show us um, how the different groups relate to each other and who gives what to whom. So, you know, let me kind of walk through this a little bit here. Spotlight out. Um, you see that the senior and executive management provides support and resources and is needed course correction to the test team. We, the test team, provide test estimates and plans as well as test result reports up to senior management. Uh, senior management provides direction to the development team in terms of bug fix prioritization. Okay. The development team provides source releases to the release engineering team, which then provides actual test releases to us. You can see also we have workarounds, release notes, unit test results coming from the development team. We provide bug reports, and we might also provide unit tests to the development team. So as you see, we have an indirect relationship as well as having direct relationships. Tech support, providing customer use cases and user data to us. We're going to provide detailed test results to them. Uh, they define what the user environments look like. System operations people set those environments up for us and support them. So, you know, showing this document to these different participants and stakeholders while we're creating the plan, you show them this diagram, and then and then it's possible to have a conversation about, oh, yeah, okay, I didn't realize that you needed that for me. All right, good. Oh, God, you know, when do you need it? But it really allows you to kind of clarify that relationship. And without that clarification, you can often find situations where, you know, you go to somebody at the beginning of, the, of a test execution period, and you say, uh, hey, I'm, I'm ready for uh, the first test release. And, um, you know, <laughs> remember one... One client told me a story about um, test manager went to the development manager and said, yeah, I'm, I'm ready for my first test release. And the development manager said, okay, well, the source code is on that um, system over there. We'll get you a login to the source code control system, and then you can just produce a build and install it in your test environment. And the test manager looked at him and said, well, I, I don't have anybody in my team that knows how to do that. Um, the development manager says, well, I don't have anybody in my team that has spare time to do it for you, so you're going to have to figure it out. So, you know, this is a kind of rude surprise, um, obviously greatly interfered with the ability to carry out uh, testing on the plan schedule, and it was completely avoidable through, um, through proper planning. So, you know, again, we can um, deal with this stuff in a proactive way, fashion through a plan or we can kind of get it's you know slapped in the face by nasty surprises like that later because we we didn't plan and you know looking at this document you can see that this is another excuse me this diagram you can see that this is another thing that could 
probably migrate up into a test strategy document if this is a general pattern of how the test team relates to other uh, groups. Now, entry criteria, again, you know, um, something that can be specified in general in the strategy. You usually have to have some specific, something specific in the plan. Uh, so entry criteria would be, are we actually ready to do testing, a uh, particular level of testing? Uh, so, you know, do we have all of the information that we need about how the system works, how it's designed, how it's supposed to behave? Um, that information provided, uh, do we have the, uh, the software itself? Is it ready to be delivered? Is everything else that we need to support test execution available? Uh, the tools set up, the test lab set up, is the environment set up? Um, is there anything else that we need? Uh, hard access keys to, for testers to be able to get into the test lab? Uh, is the software that's going to be delivered to us at an appropriate level of quality? Has sufficient upfront uh, testing work been done? These are all things that we want to potentially look at prior to starting a particular level of testing. Now, usually at the lower levels, like unit tests, um, the entry criteria are very, very lax. It's only when you get up into more formalized levels like system tests and system integration tests where you see these getting more uh, formalized. Um, now, here you see the uh, an example of entry criteria on a uh, uh, particular project. Um, let me get the spotlighter up. And we'll look at some of these. So, do we have the ability to track bugs in our tests? Okay, well, that's important. Um, is the software under configuration and release management control? Um, is the environment properly set up? Do we have access to it? Um, are all the features done and all the bug fixes done? Now, this is a project following a sequential lifecycle model, so that's a, a rule there. And have those all been unit tested? Um, from the unit testing, are there less than 50 must-fix bugs found? And we see we have a definition of who gets to define must-fix bugs. Uh, number seven and eight provide for a three-day smoke test opportunity for the test team. Check to see if the product is stable. So by smoke test here, we're talking about a sort of a basic functionality test that spans all of the major functional areas of the software and make sure that uh, it is indeed uh, ready to go. And then we complete a, a phase entry meeting and agree, yes, we should start. Now, um, a couple things here, one general about this example and one uh, more specific. Um, so in general, you notice that the entry criteria tend to reflect the life cycle. So this is sequential. Um, if it were agile, this, of course, would look different. Now, if, if we were talking about an agile project, um, you'd still want to have a plan, a test plan, but the plan would be not per iteration, but the plan would span the different iterations. Basically, each iteration would constitute a, a separate set of testing activities, but the plan would need to talk about this is how we're going to carry those activities out from one iteration to the next. Now, specifically, uh, back to this example, um, in the project, what, what we did is when uh, the development team said, we think we're ready to start system test, we said, okay, great, well, let's have um, a review meeting. And I went through and I uh, rated every one of these entry criteria as either green, yellow, or red, where green meant it's completely satisfied, no problems here. Yellow was it's not completely satisfied, but we might be able to live with it, um, and here's how we would live with it. Red was this is definitely not satisfied, and it's going to cause us some significant problems, and here's what those problems are. And so we actually went through that review meeting, and there were a number of red items here, and the decision was made to postpone the uh, start of uh, system testing in response to that. So having these entry criteria well-defined and uh, applicable to your particular project can help you uh, uh, stave off premature entry into testing in some circumstances. Now, the exit criteria, 
you know, have, have we achieved the objectives that were defined for the testing on this project? And again, the objectives should be defined. They should be in the plan. Um, so, you know, what's the, um, what's the quality of the software, right? That's something that should be addressed by the exit criteria. What's the target for that? Um, what, uh, how are we judging the, the completeness of testing? Um, if the exit criteria are not met, it should be something that would allow us to have a good discussion about the various business impacts associated with uh, curtailing testing versus continuing it, right? So what's, what's the residual level of quality risk at this point? Um, <clears throat> what's the um, path forward if we, uh, if we do curtail the testing? What's the path forward if we continue the testing? And again, we want to make sure that we've got very clear alignment um, in terms of the objectives that were set out in the test policy because remember testing testing objectives were defined in the test policy. This is what we want to achieve and the exit criteria are basically going to need to say this is how we measure whether we've achieved the objectives for this particular project. So you want to be careful to do that. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, so exit criteria from the same um, project as before. We have a stable, stable system. Nothing new in terms of uh, um, code features, etc., except to address actual defects. So we've got the system's been stabilized for at least three weeks. Uh, two and three have to do with particular classes of failures that could occur on that particular project that would have been really um, <clears throat> very dangerous. Uh, given the, the nature of the product. So we wanted to make sure that those weren't happening. Uh, have we completed all of the planned tests? Have all of the must-fix bugs been resolved and the sales, marketing, and customer service folks or the triage team get to make that decision of what's must-fix and is it done? Um, here's a housekeeping thing for us, test team making sure that every bug report in the bug tracking system uh, is in one of two states. It's either closed or it's deferred. So closed means it is actually fixed. Deferred means it's not going to be fixed. We're not going to do that. And for the ones that were closed, we want to make sure that the appropriate confirmation testing was carried out and the appropriate regression testing was carried out. This is the basically, you know, are we actually done testing? Um, we have um, number seven here that's about the... Um, what the metrics are telling us, what, what uh, our project and product metrics say. Um, this is uh, not something that we're going to get into in depth here about results reporting, but uh, this would have to do with you know reporting of results in terms of you know are they telling us that the quality is good enough or not good enough? Have we covered enough? So, completeness of testing and quality of the system is addressed here. Uh, number eight. I think this is a good a good general exit criteria is one that I would encourage you to look at and think about. Uh, it's a simple statement. Um, you know, the, the project management team agrees that the product as defined during the final cycle of system test, in other words, what was what was submitted for the final cycle of system testing, that will satisfy the customer's reasonable expectations of quality. Uh, you know, if people can't if if products and project stakeholders can't sit around in a room and agree that this is true, then should we really be releasing? And see, one of the things that I'm trying to accomplish with this as an exit criteria is to establish collective moral ownership of the ship um, decision, right? Because all too often what ends up happening is that, you know, the testing, of course, is not perfect, and... Uh, and something, you know, software gets released, and then there's a bug, and then, you know, people come back and basically say, why, why didn't you catch that? Which, which is really just a matter of, it's, it's someone saying to the test organization, why didn't you save me from myself? You know, and the test organization didn't put the bugs in there, right? Uh, so, you know, it's, it's, I think, important to try to get that, that collective ownership of that release decision and then people... Uh, uh, together um, are saying, yes, we agree this is smart. And we understand that there are still risks and the testing is not perfect, um, but we're, we believe it's smart to release anyway. 
and then number nine has to do with the uh, um, having this discussion, uh, the exit criteria in a meeting. And again, on this project, I did the same thing. <clears throat> I rate, rated each one of these exit criteria, green, yellow, red, and um, we had a meeting, and there was a lot of red, and they decided they weren't going to ship, and then we had another meeting a couple weeks later, and there was still some red, and we decided that we weren't going to ship. Um, we we're going to continue to test, and then finally we had a meeting, and there was still a little bit of red, um, and I gave my spiel about what, what the results were and why we thought that the quality wasn't good enough. And um, senior executive who was in the meeting said, well, you know, I, I hear you, I understand you, that's good and useful information, but we are going to go ahead and release anyway. And I said, um, well, that's certainly your call. Can you tell me why you, you want, why you think we need to do that now? And he said, well, excuse me, the uh, venture capitalists who are funding our company tell us that we have to have revenue this year or else they're going to shut us down um, with the very least get rid of management, put in a new team. And uh, in order for us to realize revenue, because this is a consumer product, we have to have it available for the Christmas sales season. And here we are, we're the first week of November. And uh, the only way to actually have this thing done and available by the um, Christmas sales season is for us to conclude all of the testing uh, this week and release the software for production so we can start getting it on the devices and getting it out there for uh, people to have. And, uh, you know, this is the uh, better a uh, live dog than a dead lion argument, which um, pretty much wins every time. And, uh, of course, you know, I, I said that sounds like an extremely prudent and reasonable business decision. Um, as long as you understand that there are some quality issues um, and, you know, those, those will be encountered by the customers. And you said, yes, we understand. It's not perfect. We're not, we're not where we would want to be with the quality, but we, I think we're good enough with the quality that we're going to go ahead and go live. So that's what I meant in the earlier slide about facilitating an intelligent business dis uh, discussion about, you know, what are the pros and cons of, adhering to or relaxing the, um, the criteria. Now another thing that should be uh, addressed um, specifically in the test plan, this will probably also be addressed generally in the, uh, the strategy, but it needs, we need to be specific about this in the test plan, is this issue of uh, how test releases are given to the um, product team. How, does, how do we actually get software to test? Because in, in the absence of this, you can get into that situation that I described uh, earlier where the uh, test manager goes and asks for a test release and is told, well, you know, there's, this, there's the source code over there. Uh, knock yourself out. Um, <clears throat> So we want to define things like, you know, how often are we going to get releases? So, you know, if you're in an agile world, you might very well be taking a release every morning based on a continuous integration system that runs and produces a build overnight, runs automated tests against it. You might take builds once a week if you're in a more sequential type of life cycle. Uh, hopefully, though, it's not just like any time someone feels like giving me something, uh, which in the absence of some definition of this, it, it can definitely... Uh, devolve, uh, devolve into that. Um, what's the process for installing a build? What's the process for removing a build if it turns out to be bad? That's something you want to have clearly understood. You need to have a fallback. Uh, what happens when, when we're given a build that's that's you know not not what we need and it won't work? It's not testable. Um, how are the builds named? Ideally, there's some sort of sequential numbering system, and you're able to determine what 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 build is is more recent. Uh, also, um, that should of course map back to the configuration management system. So, it should be a way of determining exactly what versions of each file that make up the system were used to produce a particular build. So we don't get this kind of ambiguity about, you know, gee, I, I don't the developer saying I don't see that on my software. And, you know, I'm not sure what version it is, so who, you know, who knows if, if this is a problem that we have or not. Once you try it again, 
Um, now, also, it needs, it's important that you be able to get at that um, um, revision number, be able to interrogate the system and say, what version are you? Um, so that's, that's, that's important. I mean, you can't, you don't want to have version numbers that are internal to the system and can't be accessed. I remember once having a conversation with a development manager who said, uh, I, I said, how, how do we determine what revision level the software is at? He says, oh yeah, that's easy. It's, it's a um, particular location in the, in the software. What you do is you, you use an octal dump and you do an octal dump and you navigate to um, the hex address. I forget the hex address he gave me. It was, you navigate to that address, and the first uh, six bytes at that address give you the uh, revision number. So the first two bytes are the major number, and the uh, next four bytes are the uh, minor number. And I said, um, I'm sure that works very well for you and your team. However, that is not going to work for my team because I have non-technical people who do not know how to operate an octal dump in my team. And everybody in my team needs to be able to get a revision number out. So could you please add, this was a command line application, could you please add a command line flag to the application that allows us to simply query what version it is? And he said, oh, okay, yes, we can do that. So you want to make sure that that's, that that's worked out if it's not, uh, uh, not immediately obvious because you don't want to be filing bug reports and be unable to say what version of the software you were testing. Also, if you're testing complex systems and systems of systems, things that interact with other systems or interact with data, uh, complex databases and so forth, make sure you've addressed that issue of how those things get synchronized. On one particular project, we were testing a complex system of systems that had uh, an interaction with a table that described the members of this, um, uh, basically the, the allowed users for a, a particular um, um, uh, piece of software and um, the uh, users uh, this, this user table is called the member table was never really properly uh, um, defined and um, it, it ended up causing all sorts of, of problems for us um, in terms of uh, um, you know the, te the software not being able to to um, interact um, properly with the database and then make sure that you've got a definition for each um, um, step of the process. This is a multi-step uh, process, getting a test release, and um, um, you know you want to make sure that you you know who owns which step because it's a it's a handoff across groups, and uh, if that handoff breaks down, then that's going to create some uh, some problems. Now, as I said, make sure that you uh, deal with how you're going to manage risks in your um, test plan. Um, uh, basically, you know, for your test-related project risks, things like delay of, of release of the software, unavailable test environments, those sort of things. Think about the different options you've got. Uh, one is, you know, mitigate. Um, you can take preventive actions to uh, mitigate the risk. Um, you can uh, have a contingency plan in place, and usually you want to have a trigger for that. Of what's how are we going to recognize that we need to trigger the contingency plan? Um, transference of the risk um, usually not a good idea, but in some cases you can transfer the consequences of a risk onto another party if they accept it, and you can also choose to ignore the risk. Um, now, make sure that you think about the costs and the additional risks that are potentially associated with a particular approach to, uh, to managing a risk, as well as the benefits and opportunities of it. Like, so the, 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 there's a risk associated with transferring the risk. The risk there is that in the event, the entity that you're trying to transfer it to will choose not to accept it. Now, um, Let's talk a little bit about life cycles here because this is very important. You definitely need to make sure that the, 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 these different documents that I've discussed are uh, compatible with the life cycle you're following. So, uh, you know, obviously the policy, you need to think about life cycle in terms of what the test process is and when you gather certain metrics and so forth. Um, the test strategy has to be very clear about how the 
testing will be integrated into the life cycle. I mean, a test strategy that would work for uh, a sequential life cycle model will be completely inappropriate for a uh, agile life cycle model. Um, the um, now we're talking about test plans um, in a sequential life cycle. You're going to have the test plan. You're going to write that just about parallel with the creation of the project plan. Um, you have exit criteria that um, will you know clearly define how the um, how we get to done. Um, you have uh, test activities that have to be clearly aligned with the different activities, the different development activities in the project life cycle. Um, now, if you're doing an a, a, um, iterative life cycle like RUP, which is not, not Agile, um, your plan is going to be written during the inception of the project, um, and then you're going to either revise it or append something to it at the start of each iteration to make sure that it continues to be a, a good guide. Um, and the same kind of thing would happen in Agile, where the test plan is written at the beginning of a project where there's going to be a sequence of iterations. It describes how the testing is going to occur in each iteration. And then you uh, revise it um, or possibly put an appendix on it at the uh, start of, the, of each iteration to make sure that it's still aligned. Um, so definitely you want to have a different, um, a different approach um, to this documentation depending on the life cycle and the, you know, a policy strategy and plan that would be perfect in the sequential life cycle would definitely be um, not what you would want in a, a sequential life cycle or the agile. Okay, so we looked at uh, policy strategies and plans, how we can use those to guide uh, testing, uh, how we can use those to define what we're trying to do, how we're going to do it work collaboratively with the different stakeholders. Um, we can uh, uh, talk about, um, you know, what, what it means for us to be successful as testers, what it means to contribute properly to the project, facilitating business decisions about whether the project is on track for success. Um, now, as I said, it is important that these documents be aligned, um, that they be um, uh, consistent with each other. Um, it's also important too that these that you you know stay focused on being relevant, being concise, um, being uh, um, connected to the realities that you're in. I remember doing an assessment once and looking at a test plan, and you know it's really described a fairly organized situation that I had been told that the situation was definitely not organized, and so I asked the uh, the test manager. So, you know, what's um, what, what's up with the test plan? I mean, I, I was told that there was a lot of um, chaotic things that go on here in test, testing, and um, you know, the, te the test plan looks very organ organized. And he said, "Well, we like to think of the test plan as an aspirational document, and this really doesn't make any sense. I mean, it's the, the policy, the the strategy, the plan. They should not really talk. They shouldn't be talking about what you'd like to do in a perfect world. They should talk about what you actually are doing. So you know, make sure that you 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 uh, have that kind of relevance. 